All right, today we have another episode from the archives with one of my incredible guests. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Guy McPherson here and super excited to have my guest today, Dr. Abby Blakesley. Abby, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right. So Abby integrates somatic experiencing with clinical research, the psychobiological principles of attachment, psychodynamic therapy, and somatic body work in her practice and teaching. She conducted original research on the role of implicit memory in somatic experiencing with a committee that included Dr. Daniel Siegel. Dr. Blakesley holds a Master's of Arts in Counseling and Depth Psychology and a PhD in Clinical and Somatic Psychology. She's interested in the intersection between neuroscience, current trauma research, and the psychobiological principles of somatic experiencing. All right. Whew, got through that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Abby, welcome. Thanks, for, thanks again for doing this. Such a pleasure to be here. All right. So before we get going, uh, I know we talked a little bit about this, but um, before we started recording, but share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you're uh, located now. Well, we were just talking about my family lineage here because a guy is calling from Oakland. My great grandmother grew up in Oakland, my grandmother and my father. So the paternal side in California. I grew up uh, right outside of Los Angeles and now I live in Bozeman, Montana. Nice. And I have uh, three young children here, and we spend a lot of time in the mountains and fishing, and kind of you know chasing the outdoors as much as possible. What? Uh, what? <laughs> just want to diverge a little here, but what brought you out to Montana? Quality of life, uh, peacefulness. Um, there's a really close knit community here, right. and the the great outdoors. You know, we're going to be talking about the nervous system. But for me and my family, we find a lot of uh, expanse and also settling when we're outdoors together. You know, nice. It connects us to a sense of something greater and uh, it's exciting. So there's sort of that, you know, there's a charge to it in a positive way. And then it's also deeply peaceful, which would mm -hmm. be more, you know, parasympathetic, rest and digest. So it's really just having that kind of um the sense of regulation in the environment, which is different. And for me in Los Angeles, there's a lot of go, go, go. Right. So I feel for many that live in cities, you know, there's a, a real pressure and demand on our nervous systems, right? To produce, right. to stay aware, to be an alert. So right. I think in those kinds of environments, we have to be even more conscientious of our evolution and right. take time to be outside see long distances mm -hmm. or even just snuggle up, settle in, take time for that rest and recuperation phase of life. Right. Wow. I really appreciate you sharing that. I mean, that resonates with me. We can talk about that later. Um, you know, we're going to talk about somatic experiencing and you're, you're interested in it and focus on uh, the neuroscience and so forth. But before we do, can we kind of really hear your story of how you got here in the first place? What, what, what inspired that in you? Well, way back, I discovered that if I gave my parents massages, they would buy me ice cream. <laughs> okay. Yep. And then, and at, what was it at um, Baskin Robbins? They had the Matterhorn, which was, you know, all different kinds of ice cream with whipped cream and chocolate sauce. And so I learned very early on kind of a love of body work and the body. And I got really good at finding knots. You know, I'd put dimes into um, phone books to see if I could feel what? where it was. Um, 
And so it was a reward. It was just kind of a, you know, basic little bit of dopamine there um, early on. And I became really curious about how bodies moved and tension patterns. And after college, um, went into body work school, became a body worker for several years. I was doing uh, polarity and deep tissue work. And I started to become curious about how I might be working on one part of the body and a memory would emerge for someone, maybe something they hadn't thought about in 20 years, or there would be a large emotional release that would happen when I worked on a muscle. So I started to get curious about this mind body connection piece. And I had a mentor, body work mentor of mine recommend Dr. Peter Levine's Waking the Tiger and Ram Das, How Can I Help? And I read both of those, and I was struck by Dr. Levine's work and how, after many years in the autonomic nervous system and in the body, we can have an imprint of things that happened to us long ago, but it's more non-conscious, just like in the musculature, right? So it can be held for long periods of time. And that actually led me into my master's program and then into my PhD program. Mm -hmm. And I let go of body work for a period of time and really focused on you know, psychodynamic work and clinical work. And through SE oriented touch work began to integrate the two later in my career. It was kind of like coming home again. Um, but I, I found that somatic experiencing has really been the foundation for the way that I perceive uh, trauma healing. I think it's one of the, and I'm biased, I teach somatic experiencing, but the reason why I teach it is that I, I just stuck with it for mm -hmm. a decade. And, and then I became a faculty member. So I've been in the field for close to two decades. Wow. And I think it has one of the best sort of progressive learning tools. It's something that we can teach our clients to be able to do themselves. And there are skills and there are tools to be able to tend to our responses that are non-conscious right? Or some are non-conscious and some are unconscious, right, right? right? Some things that we'll never really be able to pay attention to, but we can pay attention to internal things that are happening with these uh, survival responses that are right there in the lower brain, right? That are hard to access without these kinds of tools. So that's one of the things that really excites me. You're asking me about my passion and I just, I love this work. I really mm -hmm. do. And for many people, it's the missing piece, now, when you found uh, somatic experiencing SE and read Peter Levine's work, I mean, uh, for those people who aren't familiar with it, I mean, it, it, it's about trauma, right? I mean, how did you sit, how did you move into that whole topic, right? You talked initially about the body and memories and so forth, but of course, now you're moving into this or being introduced to the topic of trauma. How did you move into that and, and how did that interact with you? Well, at first it was really just a, a basic curiosity about human nature and how are we the way we are? and wanting to gather more information. Being a body worker, um, you know, really, the, they, they call it the issues and the tissues, mm -hmm. right? Um, having some, some openness around looking at kind of these the lower level responses and then how we think we are who we are, right? We have all of these ideas of who we are, um, but we have these kind of habits, ways of being that we've learned long ago that are part of the continuum of, of our experience. So I started one of the SE trainings as a body worker before I went into my mental health uh, education. And I remember in somatic experiencing beginning one, I started to feel things. I'd been a dancer prior to that. So I had musculoskeletal knowledge Mm -hmm. And I thought I was very embodied, which I was, but I didn't recognize that there's a whole universe inside of ourselves. It's as if the nervous system is a poem that unfolds, mm -hmm. right? We can have feelings that are sparkly or undulating or soft or fluid. 
we can have feelings of a, a pillar or a column. Yeah. It can be uh, vaporous. Mm-hmm. But the, the uh, learning, what we call something called interoception, which is a term that was developed by Dr. Bud Craig, who's a neuroscientist. It's a wonderful book called How, How Do You Feel? Mm-hmm. Not for the faint of heart. It is definitely a neuroscience book. Um, but they talk about this ability of a part of your brain called the insula, or the insular cortex, to consciously become aware of internal sensation. And when you have multiple sensations happening at any time, and your insula will not light up, meaning there's not blood flow, metabolic activity on a MRI machine. But when you become conscious of a sensation, this part of the brain lights up. So it's conscious attention to internal sensation. And this is actually super interesting because they find that long-term meditators actually have thicker right anterior insula, Mm. the work of Sarah Lazar. And then there's another researcher named Critchley who looks at empathy and people who have a better ability to sense their heart rate. So it's higher interoception. They score higher on empathy tests. (laughs) <laughs> and so we can look at this ability to feel yourself helps us to have a better sense of feeling others, feeling connected with others, right? <clears throat> Which is something that certainly gets lost in trauma, right. Right? our capacity to be able to take in, right? Or be able to focus on relationship or feel safe in a relationship. Poor just talks about the neuroception of safety, Right. But coming back to that full circle here with that that sensory experience, I discovered a whole universe inside of myself. And I noticed where I felt vibrant and alive. So I call that resilient. I also noticed where I felt terror, where I felt constriction in relationship to certain events or current triggers where I might Mm -hmm. go numb or feel spacey. It gave me a whole new reference point for these things that were happening kind of under my conscious radar all of the time and an ability to process those things from what we call the autonomic level or that lower level. Okay. (laughs) So that was going on for you um, when you were as a result of getting into this, this SE course. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I had a few different responses. You know, I think you mentioned about trauma. Yeah. And we can look at somatic experiencing as a trauma resolution model. But there's another side to it. I really like the idea of also calling it a resiliency building model. Because mm-hmm. what's on the other side, when we come, become less constricted, when we come out of freeze, When we discharge or release or get more organized in our nervous system, become more present to the current moment, this is where we have more resilience. We have more sense of flow, capacity, capability. Right, right. Yeah, it's funny. As you just said that, it reminded me of a discussion I had with um, Lisa Danilchuk, and she just published a book, book, and she was talking about that too. She was saying, yes, there's trauma and attention to that and working on that, but what about kind of the other side of that? You know, she was talking, it reminded me of bringing attention to this other aspect. Um, so I really appreciate that. So what happened in, in your personal experience, as you started, what, becoming a, working with people in, in this context? Yeah. <clears throat> so through the somatic experiencing training, it's a three-year training for professionals. I was doing my own personal work, somatic personal work. And then also working in a, an agency and then also in private practice and really teaching people skills and, and tools to slow down and to become curious 
about what their internal state is in the moment. So somatic means body oriented and experiencing is a verb. So it's the experience of the body in the present moment. And the healing happens in the here and now. We can talk about different events that happened, but as someone is talking, I might be tracking or noticing what's happening in their nervous system or in their body. And then I'll ask, as you talk about the stress that you feel when you're driving to work, stuck in traffic in Oakland, what sensations do you notice in your body right now? Yeah. And so that would be a question that we could explore and to sort of see where a person might be getting stuck, where there might be, we call either trauma or less resilience, kind of on a spectrum there. But let's say that's something that someone wanted to work on and they're feeling anxiety. Now, there are two branches of the nervous system. We have the sympathetic nervous system for excitation and we have the parasympathetic nervous system for relaxation. And in many of these kinds of somatic models, if you have two lines, you can imagine two lines. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a wave that goes in between. We have a you know, soft on, soft off, soft on, soft off. So sympathetic and parasympathetic are somewhat re reciprocal throughout the day, right? And we get a little bit stressed and then we settle back down again, a little bit stressed and we settle back down again. Now with trauma, what can happen is we can get into a cycle of dysregulation where we move outside of that window of tolerance into a high sympathetic response. Now, when we are threatened, it could be real or perceived threat. We go into something called the threat response cycle. This is a time limited evolutionary pathway that uh, we move through and then we should given time, given support, return back to this kind of baseline in a sense. Yeah. So we move into the high sympathetic charge. Let's say somebody swerves over towards you, you're driving the car, they swerve towards you and you go into a sense of alert. Then you orient through your five senses towards the threat. Yeah. And then you move into a sympathetic, right? Excitation in order for action. Do I need to swerve? Do I need to hit the brake? Right? What do I do? This is a, a lower brain reaction. It's happening underneath your conscious radar. Thank goodness. You're not mm -hmm. thinking through every little movement. It's an instinctual response. And then the car, let's say, swerves back. They're texting right? Maybe get a little angry. How dare they be texting, you know, say something. And then you, you start to settle back down again. At this point, your heart is pumping, you're breathing fast, your blood is circulating for action. There's several other things that happen. You're not digesting your food. Yeah. And then, you know, you get maybe get a little wobbly or shaky, a little tingly. You track your sensations when you come down of high sympathetic charge. You start to feel some of these kinds of quakiness, shakiness, trembliness, tingliness, vibration. Mm -hmm. And it's really as things start to settle back down again and then softening, expansion, warmth, gurgling in the tummy, heaviness in the limbs, yeah, and kind of coming mm -hmm. back to a resting state. So I might be tracking that with somebody as they're talking about maybe someone doesn't swerve into their lane, but now they're feeling stressed all the time. They're driving and they're consistently in this high autonomic alert state. It's not healthy for their system, right? right, right. You want to be able to move into it and then return to some level of a baseline. Now, another thing that can happen, and I think this is a great gift of Peter Levine's work, and some that Dana and other people are talking about in polyvagal theory, which is there's also another parasympathetic response that we and animals move into when there is real or perceived life threat, more severe life threat. It's a passive defensive response called a freeze response. 
then we think about this like with the possum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a everything stop, play dead. In the wild, this offers an opportunity for prey. Sometimes the predator will be not so interested in an inert meal. Yeah. So they, you know, the coyotes will sniff the possum and then think, Meh, it doesn't smell good. It's not moving. It might be, it must be old and they move on. Or the predator can actually drag the prey over or sit with the prey, either get distracted or not be interested in it. There's a lot of really interesting videos of impalas being caught by uh, jaguars and other kinds of large cats and baboons come over and chase the big cats away. I don't know why, but the baboons seem to be very interested. So you can type in baboons and impalas on YouTube and see this. <laughs> but the, so the predator gets distracted and you'll see this, uh, the, the animal coming out of freeze again through shaking and trembling. Um, if I were to ask the impala, it'd probably be tingling and feeling some coming out of a feeling of being very cold and constricted into high heat. Right. And then moving down into warmth, sweating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes some water will come out of its eyes. Yeah. And it'll start to salivate again after having a very dry mouth. <laughs> And then they will pop up and run away. So human beings, we have this same ability. At the same time, when we're in a freeze, it's an analgesic. So it's a numbing response. So if we're injured, we won't mm -hmm. feel it. Yeah. So when we have times where it freeze again should be time limited. There are going to be times where we're so overwhelmed, our bodies will decide to go in a passive defensive response and we'll go into shutdown. Or we'll get so terrified, right? Or there's a kind of a more helpless situation where there's inescapable attack and we'll go into a freeze response. Mm -hmm. Given time, given support, the body comes out of it, but without those conditions, we might remain in a freeze response at a baseline or be triggered into that freeze response when there's something in the environment that is similar enough or our lower brain assesses is mm -hmm. similar enough to the original trauma. And this is what's so frustrating for so many trauma survivors is they're so smart. You know, we're all, we're smart. If we decided to just be better, we would be. But why am I feeling afraid? Why am I having social anxiety? Why am I feeling depressed and shut down? Why is it so hard for me to motivate to get out of bed? Why is it I freeze every time that I'm, you know, trying to fill out the, the form for the job application? Mm -hmm. Why is it I'm having such a hard time connecting with my partner when they're upset with me about a little thing? I go into this deep shutdown, right? and close off. So, right, we have these patterns that are part of a survival response. Our body was trying to keep us safe, did keep us safe, because we're, we're still here. But it's the repetition of that response, which becomes dysregulation mm -hmm. in, in, in a current situation where we might want some more flexible responses available to us. So tracking the freeze, allowing the release cycle to happen with time, Sometimes with Dr. Peter Levine's work too, and and this is not as um, it's not as utilized in many other theories. As we call it, the completion of defensive responses in procedural memory, which is non-conscious, their movement patterns. So the person, as they come out of freeze, might have this feeling of running or escaping. They might have a feeling of punching or standing up for themselves. So I've worked many times with kids who have been bullied mm -hmm. right? and they've been surrounded by bullies, right? And physically harmed. So they, they went into a freeze response. And as we track, notice the freeze response, spend some time, they feel my support. They notice they're not in that situation now. They're coming out of numbness. They start to feel 
cold and a little trembly and they maybe there's a little shakiness or a little vibration could be just under the skin or it could actually become a little bit more to the surface and as they're coming out they're saying you know I I just I really wanted to scream I wanted to say something I wanted you know I don't know why anybody helped me Mm -hmm. I feel the agency in your body right now you wanted to say help me so right here and now would you be willing just to say that help me yeah. And notice what it feels like to use your voice in this moment. Mm-hmm. And I'm right here with you. You are receiving help now. There wasn't anybody there then, but I'm here now and notice that and take some time right in the repair. And then, you know, as they're, they're coming on it again and they start to feel tension in their arms. And I said, just let that tension happen. They go, that's so weird. My hands are in fists. Right. Or my leg feels like it wants to kick. And I say, well, let your body feel the power of that and go slowly and notice how that is. And then through the body, a lot of the time, the story will come forward and they say, it's so weird. It's as if I wanted to kick them away. That's right. I imagine that there was that right underneath the freeze. There's that feeling of wanting to punch or kick or get away or stand up for yourself. So let's do that now. Mm -hmm. So let me just interrupt. So just for the benefit of our listeners, what are you doing as you're walking that client through that self-awareness in that moment? There are two pieces to this. So one is called tracking, where we are together, we're following their internal sensory experience to notice what the body wants to do now. So we're going to be watching and listening and following. So if the body starts to tremble, I'll say, let that happen. If the body starts to, t- starts to tighten, we might follow that tightening to see if there's a movement pattern that comes up, right? Or if I see the person sitting up more straight, I'll say, right, so I'm attending. Mm-hmm. Are you noticing how your spine just straightened? How does that feel to you? I feel more here. Wonderful. So be in the, in the, we're tracking, we're following. Now, there is another piece in somatic experiencing, you know, when, when our students are learning SE, there's this feeling that it can be very intuitive. And yet we're actually quite conscious sometimes of where we might direct a client's attention. And there are a few things about that. One is that if there is an autonomic, like a release, like a discharge, but somewhere else is tensing or somewhere else is right feeling uh, disconnected, we might direct a person's attention to that release cycle. Yeah. Or we might direct a person's attention, let's say if an area is feeling really good and an area is feeling really uncomfortable. Depending on the person, for many people, they haven't felt good in 20 years. Right. And they're used to following the discomfort. So we say, you know, let's not pay attention to that lump and solid feeling in your neck. You just said that your that your, your chest just opened or there's a softening in your shoulders. Before we go to that feeling in your neck, would you be willing to take some time with the softness in your shoulders? So we might actually be very directive in our attention. And in the softening of the shoulders, let's see, now that the tension Mm -hmm. could increase in the throat or it may soften. As it softens, maybe an emotion comes, right? Maybe some tears the person hasn't been able to feel for a period of time. So that's sort of what, what one of the things I'm noticing. We're tracking, we're following, and I'm also helping a person to discharge or release complete, incomplete defensive responses, connected to something in the past Mm -hmm. and how the nervous system is firing in the present moment. And also making sure that they're not getting trapped in the trauma vortex. And we might be moving trauma vortex, meaning negative sensations, uncomfortable feelings, dysregulation, Mm dis-ease, and and starting to, to build a capacity to move towards where they feel better, where they feel more whole, what resources they have, 
what they think about resources that make them feel more like themselves and more present, but also embodied resources, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I love this. I love that uh, kind of drilling down into almost the, the minutia and the specifics of how someone is feeling. And I like the way you talked about it is kind of bringing their attention away from that maybe pattern that they're used to paying attention to that quote unquote negative experience. But well, let's look at the softness in here for once, right? And the power behind that, potential power behind that in a sense. Absolutely. Sometimes I, I call it the, the parasympathetic domino effect to where, you know, if you feel and attend to a place, even if it's three to 5% change. And for many trauma survivors, that's what we're looking for. Right. We're learning to track and attend to the small amounts of betterness in the nervous system, in the body, in the overall experience, in the here and now. Right. And then and some people can will notice a very uh, a much deeper response in the somatic experiencing work. You know, they can get to 75 percent betterness mm -hmm. by just attending to it. You know, just kind of one part starts to settle. Another part just starts to gurgle. Another part starts to soften. And the brain and the amygdala, which is on this alert, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? goes, oh, my shoulders are soft. Maybe nothing is wrong right now. Hmm, OK, let's kind of. Dial down that cortisol. Don't have to do all that stress response. Catecholamines in the brain start to calm down here. You don't need to keep firing. And then we go into more of that, you know, a downshift. We call it down regulation. Mm -hmm. Now, there is an interesting piece here. I do want to mention, sometimes we actually might need to steer someone towards the trauma vortex. This would be somebody who might be a little bit more in the all is good category. You know, everything's mm -hmm. great. Everything's <laughs> fine. And and also sometimes long-term meditators, for example, where there could be a way of, um, there's an embodied kind of pathway in, towards towards meditation, right? And, and, and working um, with altered states or different states of consciousness. There's also some really interesting research to um, show that there can be um, almost like a trained dissociation. So it feels really good to disconnect, but dissociation is also a trauma response of disconnecting from the body, kind of floating out there, being away from the corporal experience because it feels like too much. But when somebody lands back in, all of that dysregulation is still there. So they have to keep sort of going out. Mm -hmm. It's a more functional way, right? It's not as distressing. Um, um, but we might have to say, no, 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 don't go into that blissful state mm -hmm. of transcendence. <laughs> Come back. What's the feeling that's underneath when you're here that makes you want to go away to that place? What is the tension? What is the distress? What is the um, stuckness? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. And the, the purpose behind that is what, aside from you moving someone away from or kind of inviting them away from this dissociation into the here and now to be able to kind of open up that uh, kind of door to the feelings behind the trauma in a sense. Right. Right. And we have a lot of different ways to work with that. So sometimes just being with it, your conscious attention, tracking your internal sensation, including negative sensation, your body will start to shift. So a common question we ask is, as you feel, I'll use a trauma vortex sensation, as you feel that tension in your chest, how big is it? Does it have a shape, a size, a color? As you feel that, what begins to happen next? Does it increase, does it decrease, or stay the same? So for some people, it'll decrease. They'll feel better, right? We're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. For other people, maybe it's stuck. So I say, well, what else is there? We'll move the attention somewhere else and help the system sort of move along. Mm -hmm. Other times, it will increase, get more uncomfortable, get you know, for some, for many people spending time in the body, they leave their bodies for good reasons. 
Right. right. And so when we when we start to come back in to the reassociation process and into some of the sensations of the freeze and the terror and the fight and the flight, it's not easy. So we may also need to take some breaks, stabilize in the external environment, look around, mm -hmm. right? Find some objects in the room that the person likes, explore the room through the five senses, chit chat a little bit right, right. in the neocortex, kind of come out of that. And then we're going to tap back in a little bit, touch back in. Are you feeling any different now? Or what are you aware of? We, Peter Levine calls it titration. It's like a drop by drop model. And so it comes from chemistry, chasing, changing a base to an acid. You have to put the drop in and let the solution settle. And they have, you know, I think of all of those 1980s videos with the, you know, the, the kids have to wear the, the goggles, right? Or the mad scientists, right? Have to wear the goggles because if they put too much in, it explodes. Yep, yep, and in yep. those movies, they came out with like, you know, black hair, black and hair and soot all over their faces. And, um, so that's that idea that that drop by drop for some people, we're not going to kind of go all at it at once. And then it's a slow process of touching into the nervous system, allowing a little bit of reorganization, moving attention to different aspects, moving the system through time, coming back out into the environment, into the, the present moment. All right. Yeah. Abby, man, it's. I'm just looking at the time here. We this could go on for, forever. I mean, there's so much richness here. I really appreciate. It. I didn't even get to asking you about the 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 awareness, and you know, and I love talking about this awareness of the the person doing this, the therapist. That's just, you know what's required. I mean, you talked a lot about your background as a body worker and a dancer. I mean, but. As, as we close out here, you know, the people are listening to this. I know they're getting, oh my God, this sounds so intense. <laughs> if someone is interested in, in learning more about this and maybe even jumping in, and um, wh where would you direct them? Yeah, so I would highly recommend going to our professional website, which is traumahealing.org. So if you're a professional and you're interested in learning about somatic experiencing, we have articles, we have wonderful training programs all over the world. If you are interested in receiving somatic experiencing, we have a practitioner directory and you can click on there and you can look for providers in your area. If there's no provider in your area, you can also look for people who do online work. And you mentioned, you know, it's, it's in, Tense work, but it's also can be exquisitely gentle, mm -hmm. you know, because we are working in this titrated way. It really helps people begin to have this deeper sense of wholeness, you know, when they can connect to that sense of source and sense of self and allow some of the release or the reorganization. It's a real relief mm -hmm. to the, to the nervous system. Um, and like I said, it really can be the missing piece right. for many people. I really encourage everyone to try it. It's made yeah. a huge difference for me in my life, which is why I teach the work now. Well, that's awesome. So, um, you know, you mentioned a few books, Ram Dass and um, How Do You Feel by, was that Bud Craig? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll have those listed up. Um, and of course, Peter Levine's uh, work and so forth. But aside from that, um, and it doesn't have to be trauma related or not. I can see the, 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 the bountiful of books behind you. What, what kind of go-to book recommendation would you have for listeners? Something that's kind of stands out to you. Well, you know, the Peter Levine book that I really love is in an unspoken voice, which mm -hmm. is the, the newest book. He also has a great book called trauma and memory. If you're a therapist, you might find some real interest in that because it, it's all about implicit memory and working with that kind of play by play. Um, you know, I, I read a lot of different things. I mean, recently Bud Craig is my, he's really my, my hero. 
<laughs> and that's all of that work on interoception, which I find so fascinating. Of course, there's Stephen Porges, polyvagal theory. Deb Dana has a great clinical application of polyvagal theory. Um, she has her own modality, but SC has been working with polyvagal theory for, um, I mean, I think we were one of the first therapies that recognized it and started using it as a, in a clinical model. So I'd say those are my, my go-to books. There's uh, also Maggie Klein and Peter Levine have wonderful books, um, Trauma Through a Child's Eyes. And if you're a parent or a caregiver, they also have Trauma Proofing Your Kids. Mm. And they're, awesome. they're excellent somatic approaches to working with kids. And of course, I have young ones, so uh, and I work with kids and families. Um, so it's a... a great primer to kind of bring this work and embodiment practices because we can do this when we're older but we can also begin to bring it right from the get-go into young people's lives and that's very exciting to me awesome well abby it's been a delight having you on here and um uh, you definitely give us like this mini masterclass and <laughs> somatic experience i want to <laughs> thank you i want to thank you so much for for coming on board here you're welcome it's been such a pleasure appreciate right. it Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye.